and I'm going to do something probably a little different, maybe breaking course from where we've been going, but I told you if the Lord would so direct, we would. And that's what we're going to try by the help of the Lord this morning. Now, I came to camp with nine sermons that I'd worked on, prayed about, and I'm getting to start on my fourth one this morning. So if you would like to hear the other five, you may come to Fairmont, West Virginia. Preaching services start at 10.30 on Sunday morning. We would be happy to have you. And uh, the conference might wonder why our church is growing. But uh, you're welcome to come. We would love to have you, but you stay home where you belong. <laughs> as much as I would love to have you. I want you to be honest with me this morning when I ask you three questions. And I don't want you be to be afraid to answer them by standing. I want you to answer them and be very honest this morning with me. All right? For the first one. How many of you in my congregation this morning are married? Would you please stand? Thank you very much. You may be seated. It's a good thing you husbands stood because your wives would have let you know about it if you hadn't have. How many of you here this morning are planning on getting married? Would you please stand? You have plans made. That's all right. Stand up. Thank you. You may be seated. Now for the third question, I want you to be very, very honest. Don't you be bashful. And don't, don't you lie by sitting down. How many of you in the service this morning, someday, want to get married? Would you please stand? <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. That's wonderful. What I have to share with you this morning, I trust I can tie all three groups in. I don't know that I can, but I know the last group I have very much for. Those that want someday to get married, and then the second group, those that have made plans on getting married. And for you that are already married, you see me in private. And I will try to help you. Our text has been, Seek, and ye shall find. <laughs> what an appropriate text. We've been using it throughout the camp, and I could not get away from it for this morning. Shall we stand and we'll have prayer together, please? Our Heavenly Father, we so thank Thee for Thy wonderful presence that we have sensed in our youth tabernacle from morning to morning. You've been so good to us and we praise Thee for it. We're so happy that we can belong to Jesus Christ and not have any doubts or clouds or question marks, but know that Jesus Christ saves us from all our sins. We praise Thee so much for that here today. And we're praying, Lord, as we look into our subject for this morning, that you would give us that leadership and direction that we need. We know there are many pitfalls and traps out there that the devil would no doubt try to get our young people to fall into. But we're confident that our God is able to direct and guide. And we're praying that you'll just give us the wisdom that we need in bringing the Word of the Lord this morning. Lord, we're going to praise You for everything that You do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Are you frantically searching for a lifetime partner? Has your mind ever been cluttered with such thoughts as, I better hurry and locate the right one while the pickings are good? <laughs> Have you often felt like a child in an Easter egg hunt and Felt like you wanted the golden egg? Have you experienced such depressing thoughts as, will my lifetime partner like me? Am I acting just right? Or will that special one slip by me and I'll be left out in the lurch? Well, I have good news for you this morning. The search has been called off by God Himself. Look at what He gives us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you. 
and watching everything that concerns you. Isn't that wonderful? God has a complete, detailed plan and program for every one of our lives. Just think, would He leave out the most important ingredients for your happiness? Of course not. He wants you to be happy and He's going to do everything He can to make you happy. He made a special promise in Psalms 37 and 23. The steps of a man are established by the Lord and He delights in His way. And God wants you to know at the right time and in the right place, He will bring you together with that very special one that He wants you to have in life. Now there are many, many things that we could notice this morning about courtship, about starting out in courtship, but we're just going to have to hurriedly try to have a touch and go situation here and trying to get you out in time for the evening service tonight. <laughs> but I would like to start at a very good point on the purpose of dating. What's the purpose in my dating a young man or my purpose in dating a young lady? Well, dating is fun. Dating is wonderful fun. It's important fun. And it's wonderful to be able to date. And to date without knowing or without thinking that I have to marry the first one that I date. I'm wanting to have an enjoyable time, so I'm dating. It's a time when young people learn to share interests, ambitions, talents, different activities together. They start noticing one another. There was a time when I could have cared less if God would have ever made a young lady. I just could have cared less. I wanted to play ball. I wanted to ride bicycles. And um, I wanted to do a lot of things like that. And I could have cared less about young ladies. But the day came when I started noticing that the Lord had a species out there that was different from the male race. Those were young ladies. And I became frantic at first like a lot of other young men and young women. And I've heard lots of young men and women say, Oh, I hope the Lord tarries long enough for me to get married. And that's their feeling. You know, they, they come to a point in life when they notice the other one and they just have a strong desire to get married. But there's so much that takes place before marriage and so much that has to be right before marriage. At what age should I begin to date? Well, setting an exact age when you should start dating is extremely difficult because some people are more mature than others at different ages. I maybe could throw this in that I do know that 12 and 13 and 14 is entirely too young to be dating. Now, you that are married should say amen when needed, when you agree. And if you don't agree, just sit there and behave yourself. But those early teen years are too young for you to be dating. You become too involved. You start thinking about dropping out of school to get married and you start thinking about running away to get married and you give up the enjoyment of teenage years and 12 and 13 and 14 is entirely too young to be dating. I was set back in my chair last October. I don't want to embarrass my daughter, but last year she was only 12 at this time and we were in a series of meetings, a revival, and she came, she went home and, and was crying. And when I, I got there and was sitting around the table with the evangelist and my wife, my daughter was crying. And I said, well, what's wrong, Lynette? And she was afraid to come out and say what was wrong. And her mother looked at me and said, well, she has something that she's afraid to tell you. And I said, afraid to tell me, what could it be? What's wrong? And uh, she pulled from underneath her or somewhere under the table this picture of a boy. 
And she said, now, Daddy, I, I didn't have anything to do with this. This boy came up to me and, and gave me this picture and asked me if I would take it, and I didn't want to be rude, so I took it. And I said, well, that was nice of you to take that picture and not be rude. <laughs> and she said, or I said, well, did it go any farther, Lynette, than the picture? And yes, Dad, he asked if he could write me and if he could call me. And in my heart, I was going, oh, oh, oh. And outwardly, I was trying to keep my composure as a father and trying to let her know that, you know, it wasn't her fault that a boy decided to give her a picture and wanted to write her and call her. And I asked her what she thought about it. And she said, I don't want him writing to me and I don't want him calling me. And I said, well, that's wonderful. We're in agreement then. <laughs> so I, I made my way down on purpose to visit some relatives knowing he would be there and... When I got there, I just kind of took him off to the side and called him by name and I said, you're a nice young fella. He's about 15 years of age and I said, you're a nice young fella and I appreciate you and appreciate your good stand. But I said, uh, there's just something I want to talk to you about. And I could see right away his eyes got big and no doubt he knew what was coming. <laughs> and I just let him know as kind as I could that my daughter was of no age to be dating. She has plans that she wants to go to college and she does not want to get involved at an early age and we would appreciate it if he would not write to her or call her because it was not going to be permitted. He took it real good and I was happy about that but I think sometimes we as parents need to step in for our girls and our boys and try to help them to see that they don't need to be putting hearts on the back of their jackets and saying, I love you, Kathy or Cindy or Susie uh, or, or Mary or I love you, George or Henry or Sam or, or Joe. That's entirely too early. But you say it's natural. It's natural at the right time and the right age. You can make it unnatural by pushing the thing and ending up in grave difficulty. If you do start dating at early age, please have a chaperone. Please have your mom or dad or somebody there that can give you some guidelines and some help. Don't run out alone and, and hope then that everything will go good. Have a chaperone and pray that the Lord will give you direction. You need to ask your parents for some help and guidance along the lines of courtship and... We have a policy set in our home and uh, my daughter is in agreement with it at this point at 13 years of age. I don't know what another three or four years will hold, but at this point. But we have a, a policy and a standard set up in our home that when the time comes that she's old enough and a young man would want to date her, that he's going to have to come to our home and make himself known to us on no condition or terms am I releasing my daughter to go out in a car with a man and not know what his name is, not know where he's from, know nothing about his background. I'm going to probe and find out everything that I possibly can find out. You say, that poor daughter of yours is never going to get married. That's all right. She'll stay around to take care of dad when he gets old and feeble. <laughs> no, I want my daughter to have the wonderful enjoyment of life and have a wonderful marriage, but I don't want her to have the wrong one. We have a policy set that even though he comes into our home and he doesn't sit out and blow the horn and expect her to run out and jump in, he's going to be mannerly. He's going to learn to come to the house and learn to open the door for her and, and learn that he's a man it doesn't make any difference to me about women's lib. I'm not in agreement with it anyhow. And uh, she's going to find a Christian gentleman I trust by the grace of God, the, the help of God that will be possible. But when it's time for them to start going out at an old enough age, mature enough age, to start dating out alone, then we have it set up that for a little while I'm going along with them. You say, oh, you're on dangerous ground. No, I'm not. 
I'd be on dangerous ground if I didn't go for a while. I'm just going, you say, but he won't be himself as long as you're si alongside. I know that. But there's something in a man that can detect what's going on in the heart and mind of another man uh, by watching him and looking at him and feeling out some things. Uh, and I think it would be wise for some fathers uh, that would save daughters uh, from running off and different things that boys put thoughts in their minds. Your happiness is the desire of your parents. And they want you to have that wonderful courtship, but ask them for some guidance. Then whom shall I date? That's something you need to come to a quick understanding of. Who can I date? If you are a Christian, you only date Christians. You, you say, but they come to my church. That doesn't make any difference. You say, but they're going to Bible school. That doesn't make any difference at all. If they are not a Christian, a professing Christian that loves the Lord, you do not date them. You say, but, oh, he's a real wonderful guy. That doesn't have anything to do with it. But, oh, if you only knew his family, his dad works with my dad, or she's so pretty, she's so sweet, but that is not the point. The point is you do not let yourself be trapped emotionally by falling in a blind love with a non-Christian. You only date someone you would want to marry. And you certainly don't want to date someone who's not a Christian if you are a Christian. I wish I could make that so emphatic this morning that if you're wanting to start dating... Don't start dating them from the public school that have no church life and have never known what it is to serve the Lord. You say, but oh, preacher, I'm going to lead them to the Lord and I'm going to show them what it is to be a Christian. You witness to them. You help them. You talk to them about the Lord. But don't start dating them because what will happen, you'll let your emotions get carried away, fall in love with that individual, and then find it very difficult to break up with them. You only date someone that you want to marry. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. You not only are going to date a Christian, but one with a good reputation. You don't want to date someone that is always running to the altar that's never settled. You want to date someone that's stalwart, strong in the Lord. You say, why do you go to such extremes to save you from heartache and heartbreak in a few years if they're not strong in the Lord? What are they going to be like after they marry you? Will they serve the Lord then? I am of the opinion, and I hope I'm not off base, but I'm of the opinion... We need to put some people on trial before we marry them. There are some boys that look at young ladies and they know they can't date that young lady because they're not a Christian. So they go to an altar and profess to get saved. And, and that's wonderful. And we're, we're happy to see them get saved. But too many times I'm afraid it's so they might capture and captivate the feelings and emotions and mind of that young lady. And then after they get married, after a few weeks, they just say to themselves, I didn't want it anyhow. I just wanted her. And I got her now. And that's so sad. But it happens all the time. You put them on trial and just see how they're going to live. Well, who should ask for the date? I hope you already know. Some girls get so excited about a date that they want to ask. They have a feeling that this certain boy is going to ask them and they just get so excited that they get carried away with themselves and, and sometimes it's almost obnoxious the way they act around that boy. They're just dying for him to come out and say, I'd like for you to... Go with me tonight to service or sit with me tonight instead of you 
standing there and saying in such a moment of thrill, um, do you have anybody to sit with tonight? Um, uh, would you like to sit with my family and I tonight? And just get so excited. You let the boy do the asking. His appreciation of you will drop so much if you are overbearing and if you try to take the lead, you let that young man take the lead and do the asking of the date. And when he asks you for a date, it's an invitation. And uh, it should be cordial, exact, and right to the point. And boys, when you ask for a date, always let the girls know when it's to be and where it's to be. That clears a lot up in their mind. You just don't go up to a young lady and say, Hi, Sandy. I'd like for you to go out with me tonight. Great. I've been dying for you to ask me. I'm thrilled. But you go up and say, Sandy, I would like to give you an invitation to sit with me tonight in the evening service at 7.30. Would you be willing? What should the young lady say? Oh, my heart is just doing flip-flops. You don't know how much this means to me. You don't know how many days I've been watching you. No. She says very kindly and very cordial, I appreciate the invitation and I'm willing to meet you at 7.30 and sit with you in the service. Always let the girl know when and where. I was reading about a young boy that wanted to date this girl and she was very difficult to date. And so it said he took his hands cupped up together and he went to the young lady and he said, if you can guess what I have in my hand, I'll take you out tonight. That young lady thought and looked. There's something in his hands. And she said, you've got an elephant in your hands. He said, no, but that's close enough. I'll pick you up at 7.30. <laughs> he wanted to date her so bad. Sometimes boys need to take a hint. Girls need to take a hint. When you date somebody one time, young people, you don't have to marry them. You're going out to share a time of fellowship together. Too many times in Bible schools, it's so sad. If you date a girl one time and sit at the table and eat supper with her, Brother, they've about got the marriage certificate signed and sealed and off you are on your honeymoon. No, it shouldn't be like that. You should be, a, you should be dating and finding out uh, different things about the individuals and, and not always going steady with every girl that you take out the first time and would you like to go steady with me? Oh, no. You're just dating. If a girl accepts the date, and respond in such a way as, I'm, I'm glad you can go. And if she doesn't respond, what are you going to do? If she doesn't accept, a lot of boys get irritated and upset because the girl turns you down. Maybe she's trying you out. Maybe she just wants to see if you're really interested enough. So some boys get so upset right away. Well, I knew you were no good anyhow. I didn't want to take you out anyways. You'll be sorry someday for this, young lady. You'll never find anybody as good as I am. And a girl should be very careful whether she accepts or does not. She should be very careful in how she responds. She shouldn't bend over double when a young man asks her for a date. She shouldn't bend over laughing. Oh, you big creep, you to think I'd go out with you. Oh, to think that I would date somebody like you. <laughs> Don't make them feel bad. It was hard enough to get the courage they did just to stand there and say, would you like to sit with me? Don't make them feel any worse. I'll tell you girls what you can do if there's a young boy pestering you and, and he won't let you alone and won't take the hints that you don't want to date him. May I give you some good advice? Tell him this. Don't tell him you don't want to date him. You talk to your father. Tell him you're having some trouble. 
and you don't feel like the Lord wants you to date this young man, and tell, tell this young man to go ask your father if he can date you. I knew that would go over like a lead balloon. But girls, when your father looks at that young man and he says, Now, Joe, my daughter is not interested in dating you. And we would very much appreciate it if you would try to find someone else in a very firm way. Generally, that's all it takes for the boy. He's scared out of his boots. He doesn't want to try anything else because now he's dealing with the father. It's not the daughter, it's the father. And if you put it on those terms, it will help. You say, but oh, Brother Bolas, I'm, I'm so ugly or I'm not talented or I just don't think I'm ever going to have a date. Yes, you'll have a date if you behave yourself and learn some manners and have a good code of ethics and have some self-respect, uh, you'll have a date sometime, somewhere, someplace out there in life. There was a young man that could not talk very well and he would stutter. Every time he would talk, go to talk, he would stutter. And he really thought he fell in love with the nicest girl in the school. And he knew that she would never date him because he stuttered. And so he made up his mind. He was going to try to stop stuttering when he talked to her. The other boys laughed at him because they knew she would never go out with him. She was of too high class to sit with a stutterer. So he practiced and this is what he practiced. Mary, will you eat supper with me. But when he started, they said he would start as practicing looking in the mirror. <laughs> but he was able to break it. And he was able to say very slowly, Mary, Will you eat supper with me? So he saw her. He was getting ready to ask her for the supper date. And he saw her coming down the walk. And he knew this was the proper time. A lot of the boys that thought he was crazy and knew that she would never date somebody like him were hiding and snickering and laughing. And he stopped her. And he did not say hi or anything because he knew he would stutter. And he said, Mary, will you eat supper with me? Bill, would you say that again for me? <laughs> Mary, will you eat supper with me? Did you practice saying that just for me, Bill? Yeah, 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 yes. Oh, she said, I would be more than happy to eat supper with you, Bill. And those boys just stood and looked. <laughs> that precious young couple ended up getting married. But he worked at the job. And the Lord will help you. Now be very careful about talking that the Lord showed me this is the one. The Lord showed me that is the one. I saw somebody in the tabernacle and I know that one is for me and they were sitting all alone and, and the Spirit directed me that that's my companion for life. A young boy did that. He saw a young lady sitting in a tabernacle and this is true. And she was sitting alone. And he went up to her after several times having noticed her and sitting alone and feeling this great impulse, you know, that she's going to be my companion in life. And so he went up to her and he said, made a cordial greeting, and he said, I've been noticing you, and I feel that the Lord would have me ask you to have a date with me. Would you be willing? She looked at him and she said, well, I'll have to talk it over with my husband first. <laughs> Just because they're sitting alone does not mean that they are not married. Too many times we're quick to jump and we find out some embarrassing situations, don't we? 
I know they say if you act like a married man, you won't have any trouble. If you act like a married lady, you won't have any trouble. But you can act all the marriage you want to, and there are still some people that make trouble. But if you behave yourself properly, and if you give right answers, you can cut down on a lot of the trouble and problem. Be careful saying that I feel very strongly until you finally know. Well, what should we do and where should we go? Every date should be a time of excitement. But remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. You must do everything for the glory of God. As you decide where to go and what to do, you ought to ask yourself these three questions. Number one, would I feel free to talk about Jesus Christ here? Number two, by going there, will it cause anyone to stumble? Number three, will it hinder my growth spiritually or that of my date? And if you will keep those three questions in mind, it will help you to know what you can do and where you can go. And then there's the question, what should we talk about on our date? I really like this fella. I really like this girl. And when I took her out, she just sat there. She didn't say anything. And I didn't say anything. I was embarrassed. And I knew she was embarrassed, but I was afraid to say something. And she was afraid to say something. That is a very bad situation. <laughs> what should you talk about? Well, start making some compliments. My George, this is a very fine car you have. Well, Susie, I want you to know that that's, that's a beautiful dress you have. Start complimenting one another. Just relax. Be yourself. Don't feel like you're walking a, a thin rope across the Niagara. You're to enjoy yourself. Get acquainted with one another. Begin to compliment one another. When my wife and I were to have our first date at Bible school, I had noticed her singing and, and watched her for a period, I think, of two or three weeks, and I became very interested. And I asked her for the privilege of sitting with her at a supper date, one hour every other week, Friday night, in the midst of everyone else in the school. But it was still a date. So when I asked her, she accepted. The class clapped for her. Because she made her boast the year before she wasn't going to date any boy. Now the class remembered and they were clapping on her behalf. She was having a date. But I was very nervous, very upset. I was dating someone that was very talented. I knew it. And I couldn't sing. And I couldn't whistle. And I was awkward. Coming from a farm, when you know when you watch a farm boy, you can or see one, you can pretty well tell he's from the farm because he just seems to take you know those steps like he's walking in between the the corn rows and and I I wanted to be very careful, I wanted to be very courteous and uh, I was practicing in the dormitory of pulling the chair out and and putting the chair in and of sitting down and and uh, praying and oh yes I had a memorized prayer for that for that meal because. Brother, I didn't want to say anything wrong. So I'll never forget putting her in her chair on her side of the table and I went around to my side and was going, well, had the chair pulled out and was just sitting down. I had my suit coat open. We had chili for supper. And as I sat down, my tie just seemed to go over and just curled right up in the chili bowl. There I had a tie full of chili. My first date. And I thought, oh, I've ruined this one. She started laughing. <laughs> Remember what I told you the other day? When I get hurt, I always hear that great chuckle. She started laughing. My tie was in the chili. Other students started laughing. But it was probably the best thing that could happen because 
there we were. We were enjoying ourselves and we didn't have that tight feeling. Uh, I'd already ruined it, so I may as well just be myself. No need to put the dog on now. I'm just Bob Bolas. So don't be afraid if you just can't say anything all the time. Say what you have on your heart and mind and you can be still a little bit. Meditate. Do something. Try to think of something to say. There might come a time in life you wish you had complete silence. So you could think. Here back a couple weeks ago, I, I'm a very sound sleeper, very quick sleeper. I, it doesn't take me very long. I, I just go to sleep. I thank the Lord for that. But I, I went to bed and went a little earlier than the rest of the family and was sound asleep. And when my wife came in, she jarred me and it sounded like she was fearful. She said, Bob, Bob. I sat up in bed and my heart started beating. I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And she said, I forgot to tell you, but Marky lifted 32 pounds of Stevie's weights today. Oh! <laughs> the day may come. You would like complete silence. Then above all else, guard your affections. Weigh your words very carefully. Don't go around telling all the boys you date you love them. Don't tell all the girls you date you love them. You go with one this month, it's Susie. Oh, how much I love you. Next week, it's Henrietta. Oh, how much I love you. And for two and three years, you've said it so much, you know there's nothing to it. Girls don't like to hear that. Boys don't like to hear it either. I went with my wife for seven months. And I asked the boys, Dean, I said, do you think it would be all right to give my girlfriend a sweetheart card? I was scared to death. And he asked me how long we were dating and I told him. And he said, sure, it's all right. It's about time. <laughs> so I gave her a a card at Easter time to my sweetheart and I signed on it. I had not told her yet, but I just wrote on it. I was frightened to tell her, but I wrote on it, I love you. And oh, I was so fearful of what the reaction might be. But I saw her then in, oh, somewhere on the grounds of school that day and she told me, she said, I really appreciate that card. Oh, how happy I was. She appreciated that card. But oh, we get so involved too quickly. You don't have to tell somebody you love them to make or want them to date you. Learn something about them as you date them. Find out something about them. Your affections will be easier to guard if you realize you are probably dating someone else's lifetime partner. And this relationship is more than likely a temporary one. If you'll keep that in mind, it will help you as you date. And then I'm going to have to try to somehow come to a close. When is a kiss appropriate? A kiss is never used like a master charge for a down payment of a date. Never. Now, I am very, very hard on this. And you will find that out. I feel like that young people can throw themselves completely out of control in just a matter of minutes. Without proper guidance and chaperoning, it's no telling how involved an individual can get or become. I've had so many young people say, as I've preached to them in day schools and churches, you have a feeling you can't trust us. No, I do trust you. But what I am afraid of is that you will not be able to trust yourself when you get out there. So it's good to leave hands off. You say, but we've dated three weeks. We've dated six months. You are still not married. When I asked my wife to marry me, it took me about 45 minutes of solid concentration. And we walked and walked and she thought I was going to break up with her, she told me later. We walked back and forth over Holness Campground. I was so frightened. But finally, I asked her, 
And then we began to talk through the months. It was about, oh, maybe nine months, ten months after we went to Bible school and then got married. But I was so glad as we talked that I was not marrying a girl that had been slobbered all over by half a dozen other boys. I didn't want a girl like that. And some of you, maybe you were in sin, and I understand that. But you young people that are in Christian homes, you ought to have some good moral judgment about you. And when you go out, you don't have to kiss that boy to make him feel secure or kiss that girl to make her feel like she's going to have another date. You can thank one another for the good time. And you don't have to stand there and just hope and pray that maybe she'll kiss you. When we were getting married, our night of rehearsal, my pastor had a good, wonderful, godly pastor. Love him to this day. And he asked me after the rehearsal, he said, Bob, have you kissed Judy yet? I said, no. We've dated almost two years. Well, how can you, you know, how could you kiss anybody at a Bible school anyhow? So that's out. <laughs> but we were home together. I was there as much as I could be, 80 miles away. But I, I just would not. And he said, you better kiss her tonight. It'll be hard on you tomorrow. I looked at him. And I said, I will not. I have come this far. And I'm not going to kiss her tonight as much as I would love to. I'm waiting until we stand at the altar. When we stood there at the altar, it was something new. It was something clean. I had never kissed a girl other than my mother or my sisters. I never kissed a girl. She had never kissed a boy. And here we were standing at the altar clean with something new. And how wonderful our first kiss. And I'm not going to tell you how many times since then I've been privileged to kiss her. <laughs> there was a young man that wanted to kiss his girl and he was trying to get around to somehow getting her to kiss him. And so he was a farm boy and had some cattle. And he said, oh, they were sitting on the porch together on the swing. Look out at the cow and the calves rubbing noses in the pasture. That sight makes me want to do the same thing. And his girlfriend looked at him and she said, well, Go ahead if you want to. They're your cows. They belong to you. <laughs> Please, young people, don't, don't give yourself away to somebody you are not going to marry and live with. Don't go cheap to the altar. Go having known I've kept myself pure. I've kept myself clean. I am standing here and giving myself completely to this individual. And if a boy insists that you kiss him, get rid of him. Just tell him you're not going to. If he tries to caress, if he just feels that he has to, stop him. There are ways to stop him. I heard one young lady testify in a Christian day school. She went out with a young fellow and he was going to try to kiss her and, and she didn't want him to kiss her. You know what she did? She said, I started singing Amazing Grace. Nothing wrong with getting blessed at the right time. Oh, the Lord, help us. Let me give you these and I'm going to close. You remember this. There are some wrong reasons for marrying. Do not marry an unbeliever. Do not marry to get out of a bad home situation. Do not marry because of social pressure. Do not marry for money. Be very, very careful if marrying a teenager. Do not marry after a recent heartache. Boys, if you've been ditched along the way, don't be too quick to marry. You might be marrying the wrong one. Girls, if some boy has just canceled an engagement and your heart is breaking, don't jump into marriage again. Your heart is still broken. Do not marry a person who is in any way addicted to alcohol, drugs, or gambling. And do not marry 
because a person says he needs you. Don't just marry him because you feel sorry for him or you want to reform him or because you want to keep him from committing suicide. I heard on Paul Harvey and I closed. He said, I forget where it was at. This lady was taken to court because there were, she was married to two men at the same time and having two families. And when they took her to court, she was questioned. They, they asked her, why are you living with two men? That's wrong. That's against the law. And she said, I married and called him by name. The first one, because he said he couldn't live without me and would shoot himself. And I didn't want him to do that, so I married him. And she said the second one said he couldn't live without me and he would commit suicide. So I married both of them to keep them from committing suicide. You don't marry somebody like that, young people. You find that one that God has for you out there. And God does have one. And He'll give you that one if you mind Him. But the most important thing is in whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And when you start dating, Set a nice goal that you will not feel cheap after you marry that individual. I wish I had a whole camp meeting just to preach to you along this line, but I don't. But somehow, God will be able to plant a seed in your heart that will want you to have a Christian companion and a Christian home above everything else. Shall we stand?